you know, once again, you just got to go to the Blackboard site, download the gymware uh, data. The bench press numbers are for obviously the velocity load because he's going up in weight. It might not perfectly show it, uh, but it was based off of a 300 pound maximum. So you can see the weight on the bar. Big plate is a 45. The next size down is a 25, 10, five, two and a half. And then on the speed deadlift, he's going to be using 155 pounds. And once again, you can see the raw numbers. We only are able to get video on the first and the last set. And so this is the last one. This is actually his first set. So you can see he's actually a little bit slower and a little bit more timid just because he's still trying to figure it out. And you can see, once again, those are going to be the mean velocity and peak velocity. In those sets, you're only going to take the best rep. So you're only looking for the best velocity on each of those. The best as in the, the fastest? Or the the term, uh, Jared. And you're going to take the fastest rep for each of those sets. Gracie. So. Sound good, guys? Which tab did you say that was under? I couldn't hear you. My computer lagged. It's OK. Labs. Labs. All the way at the very bottom. So on the sheet for lab 13, uh, mm -hmm. it has the 30% all the way up to 90, and then it does it again, 30 through 90, and you were supposed to like work back down. Does he not do that? No, 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 no. That's for using multiple people. Oh, uh, okay. Because okay. you guys only had one person. Like a lot of these labs, it's meant that we do have multiple individuals perform the lab, so you can see the variability not everyone is going to do the same velocity of 30 percent not everyone's going to use the same velocity of 40 50 60 but how they all tend to converge uh when you get to the 70 80 and specifically 90 percent but obviously we just were able to do this as a one-off so you guys can still kind of look through see the information use develop those scatter plots we've talked about so you can look at the relationship between the load on the bar and the velocity that you would expect people to be able to do What other questions can I help you guys with on the lab? You guys can either drop it in the chat or you guys can just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask it. Because I don't like talking to myself that much. So you said the information for this week was the deadlifts? Yes, the deadlifts is what you need for this week. So we don't need to watch the video? You can just so you can kind of see the visual evidence of the difference in velocity, but it's not 100% necessary. Um, was this you, was this your numbers or was this Dr. Sasha's numbers? Because you put the, put the weight and did you put the weight and height? Uh, no. Jared, I don't insult you. You shouldn't insult me. <laughs> You think my 80% is 155 pounds in the deadlift? <laughs> well, I know this quarantine has kept people in. I didn't know if you'd lost. My 80% of my deadlift isn't even 155 kilos. Come on, bud. Whenever you see that video, the weight on the bar behind him, that's what I was doing for down sets at 60%. And it's 315 plus band resistance. I was just making sure, man, you know, what are you now? About 35? Things are going to start going downhill a little bit here soon. Jared, an old lion is still a lion. Don't ever forget that. So what other questions can I help you guys with on the lab? Okay, cool. So the essentially next step we got is we're going to talk about body comp and then just touching a little bit on nutrition for sport. We're going to go further into obviously nutrition, whenever you guys get into bioenergetics, but we're at least going to kind of introduce some concepts and the bigger one to really introduce is body composition. And so when we're talking about body composition, 
you know, first and foremost is we have to understand what we need to assess or how we can assess it. So there's a lot of different ways we can measure body comp. We obviously did the lab where it showed that all of you guys are incredibly gentle with one another back when you could go out and still touch another human being that wasn't a uh, family member. But then how body comp is going to affect our potential for sports performance. Now, certain sports, it is a, has a much larger role in it than others. The key is, like anything else, is making sure that we're trying to match the athlete's body comp to whatever is optimal for their playing inside of their sport. And then we're going to learn that things like weight standards are uh, really freaking stupid, and you shouldn't do that. Um, and what we can do to try to achieve what is arguably the optimal body weight for an athlete, but it's pretty difficult. Now, when it comes to nutrition, we're going to set the basic classifications of nutrients. We have our macro and micronutrients, how they're going to be more important for certain endeavors than others, but we still have to have everything in the diet. Why we need to worry about fluid intake and electrolytes, which is mineral intake, and then how dehydration is bad. As we've already talked about, cardiac drift and the effects of heat stroke and heat illness, especially if we're getting dehydrated how we can appropriately give a beverage to an athlete to help them recover and uh, give them a more optimal diet. So before I start going, any real questions you guys have on kind of body comp or the diet you would want me to feel before we start lecturing? I got a question. Yeah, go for it. So like say, sorry, I'm kind of out of breath. Say an athlete like comes up to you and uh, like talks about how they're like vegan or vegetarian. How do you like and how do you um, like go about that and like kind of helping them out? And is that like good for athletes or is that something you want to shout like tell them that they should maybe like change? Okay, any diet can work as long as, once again, we're matching all the demands the athlete has. So if you are trying to be a pure vegan, you can definitely pull that diet off. It's just gonna require a lot more meticulous food choices than just be a typical omnivore, like arguably humans are more meant to be, which obviously means there's plants in the diet, but there's also obviously some form of animal product, specifically talking meat. And when you're looking for uh, more effectively easier digesting proteins, that's going to be animal-based proteins, dairy proteins. If you're looking for omega-3 fatty acids, you can obviously get them from plants, but your body then has to convert them into EPA and DHA. And that's just not as efficient, especially for some people, depending on genetic markers. So you can be a vegan or a vegetarian, that's fine. The key is you just gotta make sure you stay on top of things. If you wanna be a vegan or vegetarian long distance runner, that's relatively easy to do because it turns out carbs are mostly coming from vegetarian sources. I don't know of any high carb meat sources. Dairy obviously has got a lot of sugar in it, depending on the form that you're taking it in. So you can pull it off. You can have issues with iron. It's usually one of the, the first ones that kind of pops up of inadequate iron sources, specifically for a long distance athlete. Um, maybe some issues with certain B vitamins just because you don't get as much B12 when you're not doing animal sources. So it's not that this diet is better or this diet is worse as much as freaking Netflix diet documentaries would love to tell you. It's more of just understanding that you can do it. The key is you just got a lot more things you got to worry about, or you just got to, a lot more things you got to, once again, pay attention to than if you just eat a typical varied omnivore diet where you do have vegetables, you do have fruit in the diet, but you also have, you know, protein coming from meat sources. So a lot of folks are going to get very evangelical and what you find is any diet that works for somebody, that like it really gets the weight off them, they become very evangelical about how it's what worked for them, so it should work for everybody, which is the equivalent of, if the only tool I have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. 
So you just got to have people, you know, play around, test and figure out what they like and how they tend to feel the best. You know, you guys have seen my dietary choices that I typically take or make, and that's where I tend to feel the best and perform the best. I've, the high carb diets are just really good ways for me to get fat. And I'm not really about that. I tend to live a more high protein, uh, moderate to high fat intake and moderate to low carbohydrate. And it tends to suit me just fine. But other folks, they can't deal with, you know, high amounts of red meat or they can't deal with high amounts of fiber in their diet. So you just need to make sure that all we're doing is matching demands. So does that, that kind of answer your question, Jake? Yeah, it does. Okay. I have a question too. Yeah, go for it. So I know that the keto diet, that new fad is like pretty much putting your body into like starvation. Does it actually cause more damage than good? So kind of getting back to all diets can work. The ketogenic diet doesn't actually put you in starvation. Starving puts yourself into starvation. Now there's elements in the ketogenic diet that mimic certain things with fasting, which is when you go in a low carbohydrate state, your body starts making things known as ketone, uh, ketone bodies. These ketone bodies serve as an energy source for your brain because your brain really likes to use carbs for fuel. And when it doesn't have carbs for fuel, that's when you start feeling lightheaded or wonky or otherwise. So ketone bodies are something that it can use metabolically as fuel. So it's really, really useful in individuals that have issues with like seizures because the brain doesn't seem to have as many episodes whenever it's using ketones as a fuel and you've got a lower blood sugar. Um, it seems to be useful in a couple other uh, disease states. Now, people hear the ketogenic diet, they then think of ketoacidosis, which is uncontrolled ketone body, which drops down your pH and is pot potentially lethal. That's not what you're doing when you're doing the ketogenic diet. It's not that negative. But like anything else, once again, you've got other things you now need to worry about. Because since you removed a lot of carbohydrate from your diet, that means a lot of people effectively go on the meat and cheese diet. So they're not getting in a lot of vegetables. If any, they're definitely not eating any fruits. So you can have other vitamins and minerals uh, that you are potentially getting deficient in. So you just, like anything else, it's fine uh, as long as it works for you. Once people are going to yell from both ends of the spectrum of that, you know, it's awful or it's perfect, it's somewhere in the middle. Like, it's not the worst thing you're ever going to do for yourself. But like anything else, it's probably not the best choice that you can make for just long-term overall health for most people. And especially, it's just not good and not, not a good choice for certain types of athletes. Because if you're someone that really needs glycolysis for your performance, so that way you can you know, like a basketball player, um, arguably a soccer player would also prefer it to a certain point, especially someone that runs like a 400, 800 meter. And Lion King. So you can get away with doing it. Um, I've used it a number of times whenever I'm uh, not saying like I'm going keto, but I naturally use a very low carb diet when I'm really trying to cut a lot of weight, specifically fat weight, in order to go down in a weight class to compete in powerlifting or strongman. And I actually felt pretty good on it. For me, I never really had a lot of issues, but some folks, they have a really, really hard time getting fat adapted. And some folks literally aren't effectively able to. Those are folks that naturally have got issues with hypoglycemia or otherwise. So it's not that once again, it's the greatest thing in the world. The key is a lot of people think of think of their diet as a start and an end point, and it, that's not how it works. It's a lifestyle. So you need to have something that you can maintain literally for the rest of your life, a way that you can eat without losing your mind every single day. Because I'm sure every one of you has got a friend or a family member that lost the weight they wanted to lose, you know, got down to, you know, got their spring break body or whatever. And then not just gain the weight back, but overshot by potentially a pretty large margin. The cat is walking under the laptop because she is a special kitty. Okay, you're going back on the ground again. The joys of pet ownership. So, good questions, guys. Anything else you want me to feel before we go a little further into it? So you said that there's like really terrible ones and then really good diets. 
what would be an example of a good diet for a high intensity athlete? Whatever they can perform and is sustainable. So the key is most folks, okay, this is going to seem like a throwaway statement, but it's a really important thing to understand. You are exactly the body weight and exactly the body composition that you are going to, that you are right now because of all of the nutritional decisions that you've made or people have made for you and all of the exercise decisions that you have made or people have made for you for your entire life to this exact moment with your genetics and the environment you grew up in and all those other stressors that gave you exactly this body. So you've had a diet your entire life. That's what's gotten you here. If you do not like the product that is you from all of those decisions, then, well, let's go ahead and change a couple things. So for an athlete that's trying to lose weight, the first question is why the hell are you trying to lose weight? So certain folks, that's just because of societal expectations that have been thrust upon them to never be happy with their body that has nothing to do with their actual performance. Now, there are other people out there that yes, losing weight is probably going to make them healthier. Now, you have to think about what is our overarching goal? So if our goal is to lose weight so we can hit some type of BS aesthetic, so that way we can attract someone that probably isn't a good human because they're only interested in our assets. So is that really making our life better for it? Probably not. Because now we're just imprisoning ourselves in this body that we're not even that happy to be inside of and doing things that continually make us less happy. Now, if we're trying to make literal changes, so we're trying to lose weight because we want to be good at a given endeavor, and that is simply the body type you need for it, then we need to, once again, think about what is sustainable. So what can I do every day for the rest of my life and not be losing my mind doing? Because anybody can starve themselves. Anybody can just, you know, it's a really simple diet. I should probably trademark it. It's the duct tape diet. You just, and I'll, I'll sell a really overpriced roll of duct tape. Every day you get up, you have, you know, a glass of water or whatever, and then you put a piece of tape on your mouth. And then you keep that piece of tape on your mouth for eight hours at a stint. You can only take it off to, well, if you ever have to like vomit or anything, you take it off so you don't die, but you only need to take it off effectively twice per day. And that's for 10 minutes. And during those 10 minutes, you can eat whatever you want. And then after that, you tape your mouth shut again and you go like that into the next day. You're pretty effective. You'd starve, you'd hate your life, but you'd be so skinny. So that's why I'm hesitant about giving major recommendations. It's really as simple as putting yourself in a consistent caloric deficit, which can be done by either increasing the amount of exercise you're doing or decreasing the amount of calories you're taking in, but that requires people having enough structure in their day, in their lifestyle, and in their effectively their nutritional intake to really know where they're at on all those variables and then trying to start decreasing them. because you know most of us tend to we converge on a certain body weight because we have our natural activity levels and we have our natural caloric intake if i bump the one up and i keep my activity levels the same eventually my weight's going to go up until i'm now big enough that just keeping that amount of body size is going to have an extra caloric demand so we're going to be equal if I systemically keep my calories low, eventually I'm just going to decrease my body size and my hormones relating to just resting metabolic rate low enough that now we've converged on this weight. So you need to think about small changes that are going to slowly shift you where you want to be that you can maintain for a long period of time. Because that's the thing that a lot of people have a hard time grasping, which is the, the method you use to lose all the weight or to gain all the weight to where you want to be is the same method you have to keep doing forever. And most people don't want to do that. So smaller sustainable shifts is probably the best place to start. And for most folks, it's usually either pull out BS out of their diet, AKA usually liquid sugar, soda, pop, whatever the hell you want to call that stuff. And then, and or if you're trying to gain weight, it's making sure that they're eating at least three, if not four meals per day, and then slowly trying to increase 
the calories that happen to be at those meals. So does that answer your question, Courtney? I know that was a lot. Yeah, it does. So it's pretty much just, it's different per every single person. So like not one certain group, like we say, like softball players, you can't put every single softball player on one diet. You can't put every single football player on one diet. Yeah. Pretty much what you're saying. Yeah, everyone has their, everyone has their own tastes. Everyone has their own things that they prefer. Um, okay, I'm going to say some things that is true for me. I do not want you guys to um, be, be mean to me, but I want you guys to be honest. And, and please respond in the chat. I kid you not, my favorite candy, and I eat candy very rarely in my life, is black licorice. Are any of you guys a fan of that? That's so gross. I told you we're not judging people, Jake. <laughs> wow, this is this got really hurtful really fast. Okay, so if we lived on an island and the only form of candy was black licorice, I guess I'd be the only one eating it and all of you would be looking down uh, your noses at me. And that's okay. That's okay. That hurts my feelings, but... Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Also, I'm not a fan of chocolate. I think it's overrated. So if your goal is to take someone like me and try to get me to gain a lot of weight, like, oh, if we're going to do you know, chocolate ice cream every night and everything else, be like, no, nah, we're good. I'm, I'm not going to overeat on that. But if you throw, I don't know, what food can you guys think about? If someone literally gave you an unending amount, you could you would eat yourself sick with it, like it's probably not raw broccoli. Yeah, peanut butter. There you go. Yeah, I know many people that that has destroyed many a good diet for them because they just oh I'm just gonna have a spoonful of peanut butter and one jar later they realize they just put down like you know four to five thousand calories. So you're looking at individual choices, individual preferences. I'm sure there are certain things that you guys like that other people really don't enjoy. Um, and that's okay. It's not okay to be so judgy about that stuff. But instead, you're just trying to make sure you find the diet that works for your athletes. Some folks, they need to throw down carbohydrates like they're a damn hummingbird because they just happen to turn over, they've got great insulin sensitivity, and if you cut that back, their workouts are gonna really suffer because they just don't have the energy source that they used to. Other folks are like me that are a, more of a, someone that doesn't really get a whole lot of a heart, out of a high carb diet, but they tend to do pretty well on a more higher fat diet. And there's a lot of things that are confounding it, like your genetics, like your environment, like your goals and everything else. So hence, there's no cookie cutter approach other than we've got some basic things of you need all your vitamins and minerals, you need an adequate amount of protein each day, you need an adequate amount of fat each day, and you probably prefer to have a certain amount of carbs each day. But as far as what are the sources of those proteins, what are the sources of those fats, what are the sources of those carbs, you got a lot of flexibility. And so, you know, coaches can be real jerks and try to tell people they gotta be one way or the other. The key is to make sure, once again, you're trying to find something the athlete genuinely wants to do. Because if, you know, your coach told you you have to gain weight and the only way to gain weight is by eating an extra, you know, three pounds of, you know, plain pasta every day, like that sounds like a punishment to me. And I'm sure there's a lot of you guys that would not be interested in doing that endeavor. Whereas there's other folks like, yeah, bring it on. I'm going to be like Garfield with a lasagna. And that's fine. You just got to figure out what works for you. Any other questions? Since we're, I guess we're gonna be doing most of this talk in rant mode. Nothing? Any of you guys ever tried pistachio ice cream? That's another favorite of mine. That stuff's really good. I will agree with you that that's pretty decent. Okay, there we go, there we go. So, when it comes to body comp, guys, obviously the way that we think about it and the way it's usually taught to you guys initially is just fat mass and fat-free mass. Now, fat mass is not just the things that are going to make you feel uncomfortable at the beach. That's also your bone marrow is mostly fat. 
your nervous system. So like your brain otherwise is mostly fat and every single cell in your body is wrapped in a fast or sorry, in a phospholipid bilayer, which is made up of mostly fat. So we have a solid amount and that's, if you're looking over on the right, you can see that two compartment model. But in reality, if we're going to go into the anatomical model, like yes, adipose is going to make up most of that fat mass. And for the fat-free mass, we've not just got our muscle that we think of when we're moving the body. We've got our tendon, our ligament, all of our internal organs outside of the nervous system. We've got bone, which is way over represented in this graph here, but that's okay. It's not really to scale. And then we have others. So that's going to be like the fluid in your digestive tract, your synovial fluid, blood, and your fascia, everything else and skin that's brought into it. Now, chemical model is if you think about melting human beings down into their constituent parts. We are mostly water. From there, we're going to be, depending on your body size and body composition, then the rest of it's, the next big component is going to be either fat, protein, or minerals. And then a very small amount is going to be carbohydrate, usually less than a full, really a full kilogram if you look at the entire body overall. So when we're working with athletes, we're trying to obviously assess these things and we're typically only looking at the fat mass and the fat free mass, which is going to give us a little bit more information because like anything else, knowing someone's height and weight isn't necessarily that useful. You know, I'm five, five, 10 on a really good day, like five, nine and a half. And I weigh about two, I was actually less than two ten because I've haven't been eating my feelings tinkers because I've been so bored here. Um, and so, but still, if you hear a guy weighs about 210 and he's not even five foot 10 and you can't see a picture of him, you immediately think like, oh, that, that person's probably got some weight to lose. Um, and so in reality, you know, body composition wise, I'm, I'm doing fine. But we have to keep in mind just having somebody's height and weight can be really misleading because how you carry 200 pounds, 150 pounds, or even 100 pounds is really different. I will always remember when I was at uh, Kansas doing my PhD, there was, we did a, the same type of body comp lab that I do with you guys. And we did the DEXA scan. And one of the gals in there, she came back at like 35 or 40%. And she was, I kid you not, maybe all of five foot two and barely over a hundred pounds. And she, yeah, she sees her numbers and she's like, how do I have that high body fat? I'm like, like, well, um, do you work out? She's like, no. I'm like, okay, okay. Um, do you, do you like watch what you eat or diet? No, no, I just eat whatever I feel like. I'm like okay. And then what I wanted to follow it up with, but obviously we're being nice and, you know, people are always uncomfortable with their body comfort. Like, why would you think you'd have lower body fat? Because you don't work out and you don't eat. Like, just because you're small, doesn't mean you've got a low body fat. And just because you're big, doesn't mean you have a high body fat. So hence, it's really important to know this because it well, lets us know like, okay, yeah, the athlete's bigger, but they also have more muscle mass, which typically makes you a better athlete in most sports. And just because you're smaller, once again, doesn't mean you're smaller because you don't have any fat. Some people are smaller because they don't have any muscle. Have any of you guys ever heard of, a, well, I believe it's called TOFI? It's the acronym. Sam says no. Uh, Tofi is uh, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. So you, there's a lot of people walking around that are arguably normal body weight. So if you're going by BMI, they're normal. But if you actually ran body comp, they're mostly just, or not mostly, but they have a high percentage of body fat because they don't really have any muscle mass. And like anything else, you can be overweight or obese by BMI and still be healthy just like you can be normal weight by BMI and be unhealthy. In fact, it's usually a tune of about one third or more on both sides. Take stones. Thank you. Okay. Now, you guys have had a chance to do a number of different ways of measuring body comp in class. Do you guys have any questions about how we went about it? or how you would maybe try to use that information depending on what type of athlete you're working with.
Tinks really likes getting your ears pet. No questions about the different methods of how we measure body comp? Interesting. We're going to have to go back to the floor in a moment. You okay with that? You okay with that? They're not asking me any questions. Well, at least they've talked some today, so it's not the normal loneliness of being by myself. So, pensatometry. I'm sorry we didn't do this when you guys were there. If you want, I'll, I'll see if I can get Aaron Sasha to do it and take a video of it and put it on, uh, put it on YouTube for you guys to watch because it sucks. You have to not just sit in a happy little PVC chair, and we actually have it rigged up that we'd use that uh, little pool that's in the athletic training room. And you sit on the chair, and there's a scale on top because we weigh you outside the water and then weigh you in the water because, like the good old analogy of muscle sinks and fat floats. Now, here's the thing not only do you have to hold yourself underwater, but then, okay, you're going to the floor, girl. Back to the floor you have to hold yourself underwater completely submerged with all of the air out of your lungs until the scale stabilizes and then we get a measurement and then you can come out. It is really uncomfortable. And it does give us some pretty good information. Not everyone's gonna do the best job of it. And it is the old school gold standard, but that does require people to go ahead and get themselves not just in swimwear, but to be underwater. Yes, I know, Tinks. I'm wearing sweatpants today, see. Okay, so we're gonna go back to talking more about the body composition methods. We've got our DEXA scanner, which you guys have had a chance to do. Now, the DEXA scanner is really useful because it gives us lean body mass, fat mass, and bone mass. So we can get some potential ideas on risk for things like osteopenia, osteoporosis, stress fractures, and we can localize it to the limb. So that way, say goodbye, Tinkers that way we're actually able to look at asymmetries between one side of the body and the other we can also go ahead and look at effectively where does someone carry most of their muscle mass because if someone's playing soccer and they just decide to be a total bro and they've only got muscle in their upper body that's not where the mass is going to be really useful for them when they're playing their sport it's going to be having that muscle mass in the legs because that's how they're not just going to move down, up and down the field, but they're also going to be kicking the ball. Now, there's the bod pod, which you guys did, which is the egg you sit inside, which is effectively the modernized version of the underwater wing. It is, you know, pretty accurate. It does have its issues uh, with it because it is based on density. In fact, hair is going to influence the responses. It is too easy for her to hop up here. And because of that hair amount that you have, you're going to sometimes displace air a little bit differently. So it's going to actually, extra body hair is going to underestimate your body composition, specifically guys with beards. And then uh, less hair can, is gonna give you a much more accurate assessment. Now you guys did skin folds where you guys can pinch an inch. The nice thing about them, just like doing girth measurements, is it's relatively cheap and easy to do. Now obviously it can have some issues with accuracy if you're not gonna get in there and be aggressive but obviously it's highly portable. You then have bioelectric impedance. That was both the tanita you stood on and then the wonderful sozo that you had the hands on and the feet on. Those, specifically when you get to going from the four point, we're just going through the legs and it's only giving us the lower body information. We go to the eight point, now we can go not just from hand to hand, hand to leg, leg to leg, and a number of different variations on that. So it's gonna give us a lot more holistic information as to body comp, but it still has some flaws in the system because it's, assuming that people are built in a certain way, so electricity is going to always flow through them at a certain rate. But if, you, if you're longer limb for your height than you suspect, or the other way, it can over or underestimate your body composition, effectively or respectively between the two. Now, with that fat-free mass, so if I clicked on the right thing, it'd be dangerous. It's gonna be really good for us to know. Because like anything else, now we've got an idea of how effective is our training program? How effective is our weight changing with our athlete? How effective is effectively our goal that we're trying to do? Now, is having fat-free mass bad for endurance? It depends on, of course, the amount. 
like anything else, as long as it's not getting to be too far to one end or the other. And if you're trying to be a marathoner, ultra marathoner, somebody that is really doing crazy distances, yeah, it's going to be easier if you've got a smaller body, both lean mass and fat mass. Now, fat's a good energy source, but it's not really doing us any favors when it comes to uh, aerobic performance because it's weighing us down. But here's the thing. Fat is also working as a padding for the body. It's giving us a little bit more sometimes of leverage at certain points for our joints. It is important for hormone production. And so you want to have an optimal amount of fat for the athletes you're working with. We're not trying to get everybody to be insanely lean. Instead, we're trying to figure out where does that athlete perform the best at, both when it comes to body weight and body composition. Because at the end of the day, we can always give ideas of like, yeah, you should be within this percent and this percent body fat. But what we should really look for instead is where does that athlete perform the best? When they're lean, when they're a little bit heavier, where they're somewhere in between. Wherever the athlete happens to play the best at, that's the type of body count that we should be trying to maintain. Because like anything else, some individuals are going to do better leaner. Some people are going to do, or do better, we'll call it fluffier. And you have to be mindful of that. I like how, once again, this book is written by people that don't understand resistance training. Most of your weightlifters and powerlifters that are in the anything less than the super heavyweight classes are pretty damn lean guys and gals because you're trying to have as much muscle mass as you can inside of that weight class. Now, obviously, sumo wrestlers, yeah, that's part of the game to be as big as you can, just like offensive linemen. And swimmers, it depends on the role. If you're a sprint style swimmer, you actually be pretty lean because yeah, you're not gonna be as buoyant, but you're so damn fast and applying so much force, it's not that big of an issue. But if you're a long distance swimmer, yeah, you actually do wanna have a greater amount of body fat. But as we learn when it comes to diet, nutrition, and body comp, it's never that simple. There's always some, it depends, or subtlety that you have to at least respect and apply appropriately. So, when it comes to weight standards, really dumb. Because like anything else, your highest level athlete in any given, or the, op, the elite athletes, pretty much let you know the type of body type you really need to be to be successful in that sport. So guys, give me an example where like the elite level athlete in that sport has a different, or has a, how to say, a very standardized body type. So if you saw a group of them, you'd be like, it's that sport. Uh, like football players, like O-line, D-line. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, offensive line, defensive line. Now, if you go with the entire football team, you'd be like, it's, pro it's a more muscular than average dude, and they tend to be, you know, they could be pretty much any height, but they tend to be at least normal height, if not a little tall, okay? But even then, if you, if you see an entire football team, that's a pretty wide variety of body types. It's not like you just got the, you know, the one type that keeps popping up. What type of sport can you think of where it's just you only see the same body type? Long distance running. Okay, now how are long distance runners, in, how are they similar? I feel like they're all very lean and muscular and skinny. <laughs> I don't know about muscular, but I will definitely give you lean. And they all tend to be pretty narrow. They might be taller, they might be shorter, but they're never broad people. When you're talking about high level distance runners. Good. What other sport can you guys think of? Like swimmers? Yeah, swimmers, you're going to see, especially the highest levels, they all tend to be tall people, broad shoulders, narrow waists, you know, kind of long arms, mm -hmm. longer torso. That tends to be pretty useful. And the last one that I throw in there is uh, gymnasts. You, you never see tall, high-level gymnasts that, of either gender. It just, it doesn't happen. You know, they tend to be small, pretty compact, powerful people. Yeah, they're pretty muscular and yeah, they're pretty lean, but there's definitely a body type that's selected for. Just like, obviously, NBA forwards. You're looking for incredibly tall and incredibly lanky guys. And forwards in general for both genders, or WNBA also. Now, give me a sport where you see a wide variety of body types, one that would be really, really difficult 
to say, you know, what is the best body type to have to play this sport? Track and field. Yeah, yeah. Well, track and field is, is a conglomeration of a lot of individual sports. Like, you know, throwers are obviously very different than short distance that are very different from, or different enough from middle distance and then definitely different from your long distance. But think about a, a sport where it's, it's a true team sport. Yeah, so, softball. Yeah, bingo. You know, it turns out Sammy, uh, Tori, and Gracie all stand uh, next to each other you're not going to immediately think, oh, well, this is obviously a women's basketball team, and Sammy is obviously the student manager because she's the short one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Sammy. We, we both know that's definitely not what you do there. But you're right. Softball, and I would say also sports like soccer, you see a pretty wide variety of body types. You know, you get some athletes that are taller, uh, some that are shorter, some that are broader, some that are narrower, narrower but it tends to be, you know, pretty cosmic. Uh, it tends to be, you know, a pretty diverse types of bodies that can play on a high level in that sport. Just like I would also say the sport of baseball. You've got some dudes that are big and let's say and fluffy will be the term that we use. And then you got other folks that are pretty small and lean. And yes, there's different roles on the team, but you definitely have a, mo a lot more, you know, heterogeneous sample of body types in those sports. So hence certain sports like, yeah, if you want to be a really good long, or you'll be a really good gymnast and I'm sorry, Tori, you're too tall. Like you just, you, you, you sized out of it. Just like I'm sorry, Sam, you're not going to be a forward in the WNBA, even if we had you running around on stilts, like there's certain limitations, but for most sports, we don't have to go and say, this is what you need to be. And plus, What's an inherent flaw of using elite level athletes as an indicator of what your amateur, meaning your middle school and your high school athletes need to be in order to be the best? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, no worries. What's the problem with using elite level body types to then say this is how your amateur low level athletes should be built? Like what if they don't know what sport they're going into yet? If they're yeah, younger. Is, yeah, we don't need, necessarily need to specialize. True. True. What else do you guys think might be an issue with that? Guys, how many kids playing a high school sport are going to even manage to keep playing that in college? Not a lot. There we go. Way to, way to quantify things, Tori. Come on. We're <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure. It, it, it's probably less than one in 10, right? Would you say that? Yeah, that makes sense. Not to get depressing for Jake and, you know, I'm, Actually, it looks like everyone on here. Oh, no, I mean, Courtney, there are people that try to go pro in cheerleading. So I guess really, we just got the athletes left in here. What's the issue? Or how many people that play a sport in college are actually going to play that professionally? It's like 2%. Yeah, it's, it's not great. You're talking, you know, your odds are close to 1 in 50. So, yeah, your elite – athletes they do have gifts they do have differences but most people are never going to rise to that level so instead there's nothing wrong with you know eh, yeah you played high school sports you had a good time you moved on you you know you play college sports you had a good time you moved on but we all do have effectively a genetic ceiling and we're you know some of ours are a lot higher than others and that's coming down to genetics that's coming down to some other limitations that we all just have thanks to the environments we grew up in and the opportunities we had, but just understanding that like, why the heck are we going to worry about our high school cross country team 
and every girl needs to be a you know BMI of under this number, like screw it. If the kid likes to run, just let him run. Who cares if you won the high school championship? That's nonsense. I mean, who even cares if you really won the college championship? Which don't get me wrong, guys. If you do win that, that's awesome. But at the end of the day, who cares? It's not going to make a big difference on the outcome of your life. But if you cause an eating disorder on an athlete, that's going to have a lot more negative effects on the outcomes of their life than whether or not they had a good time playing their sport. So hence, weight standards are really stupid. And we should avoid them. And instead focus on the actual performance metrics because that's what matters. Because who cares if an athlete is considered morbidly obese by BMI, if every time that person steps up to the plate, they hit a home run, they don't have to worry about how fast their 30 yard time is, or their, I guess for late, it'd be the 20 yard time because you can walk the bases. So just being mindful of that. So any of you guys have any experiences of coaches that try to use weight standards and ever try to push you guys one direction or the other? Yeah, go go figure. Was what uh, was this from cheerleading, Courtney? Absolutely. Ugh. And let me guess that uh, that the coach has won, you know, multiple world championships. You know, they just always have successful seasons. They've never not placed, you know, first. No, she was a coach that was obese her entire life, but wanted all us all to be under one hundred and ten. It's, you know, hopefully as you guys get older, you realize that, uh, yeah, like I'm older than you, so I'm technically the adult here, but I'm just older than you guys. Most of us are just children. We're just taller and less cute and a lot smellier on average. And some folks are still children into their 30s, 40s, and 50s and, you know, projecting their own insecurities on other people, which it's just, it's not fair. You know, I've had coaches that try to do that nonsense. Um, you know, I've seen it happen when I was uh, a cheerleader myself in college, but it turns out as a male, they're kind of like, do whatever you want to do. Uh, I know I was built a lot like this back then too. So they're like, okay, you're doing fine. But you know, yeah, the pressure that the gals would have to be small, especially when they got to be out there in a freaking bare midriff um, uniform, not a lot of room to hide. It's not necessarily going to be anything that was affecting their performance as a cheerleader, just affecting their, you know, self-esteem and ability to have a good relationship with food. Because, and I guess this will be the last little thing. Oh, actually, I'll talk a little bit about making weight, because I can tell you how to really go dark there. Um, in that, I, would, I used to have to cut a lot of weight for uh, competitions because I would compete in, in powerlifting and weightlifting or powerlifting is stronger and there's weight classes and I didn't use anabolics. So I didn't want to compete against guys that were using anabolics and weight as much as I do or bigger. Instead, I'd rather cut weight and compete against the guys that were lighter than me, but also using anabolics because honey, since you can hear the conversation, uh, whenever I was doing powerlifting meets, how was it that you would uh, figure out which one I was at the meet? Look at all the backs and see which one didn't have packaging on it. Yeah, I was bringing a, a knife to a gunfight. And uh, also to, to throw in the last part, honey, what did you tell? What, what did you? Can you guys hear my wife, by the way? Since I'm not sure if any of you guys can. Okay, she, yeah, Courtney says, yet yeah, barely. All right, so the, the next question will be, honey, what did you tell me if I ever try to make weight as a 181 lifter ever again? What would you do? That I was going to leave you. You're a nightmare, A, when you diet, but B, when I think that you're going to pass out in front of me. What was my color at that point? Gray. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I cut weight. I would diet down to usually like the 190s, low 190s, uh, high 180s, and then I would de dehydrate out the last 10 or so pounds. One year it was 18 pounds in uh, 24 hours, and yeah, I, I looked like a human potato chip. I was so ripped though, I was so ripped, no, I'm kidding. 
I felt like garbage. And Lauren was with me throughout all of that and got to watch it and obviously told me, if you ever try to do that again, I'm leaving you. So ever since I've been, a, I've been a, which is funny as a guy that's only like five, 10 on a good day, I can never weigh less than 185 pounds. You can, you just can't have all the muscle mass that you have and have it still be healthy. She's the reasonable one. So when you're trying to make weight with an athlete, you can manipulate water as a means to get them to make weight, but it depends on when you need to weigh them in. So for powerlifting, strongman, and things like MMA, a lot of those do a 24-hour weigh-in, meaning you can weigh in on Friday and compete on Saturday. So you have 24 hours to get your weight back up. So I know a number of guys that would use um, drugs like Lasix, which is a drug that you typically give to somebody that has issues with fluid retention. So they effectively pee out a lot of extra fluid. I would do it through sauna use, hot tub, hot baths, sweating it out effectively, kind of wrestling style, which still has its issues with electrolyte loss and it can be dangerous, obviously. Uh, when you start going over 10% of your body weight or initial body mass loss through dehydration, you're really risking literal damage to your body. So you, you shouldn't do it. Um, now, the key is with those folks that use Lasix, they would then typically do IV rehydration, where I would just pound down food and water and everything else to get the weight back on me. And it, it worked. Um, sometimes we're better than others. It's really hard on your GI to go through effectively 24 hours of starving and dehydration to then go for 24 hours of feasting. And in hindsight, I did a lot of things poorly, uh, but I was, you know, I don't know, uh, invincible. I was 24 to nearly 30 years old. And uh, that was the method I used. And, you know, to be fair, I, I placed in the top three, in the nation of the world and some stuff. And I won one or two. So that's cool. But at the end of the day, it's hard physiologically on the athlete. And it obviously brings up uh, and introduces a number of uh, facets of danger. So if you have an athlete that's trying to make weight for a competition, the key is to start trying to make that weight months ahead of time. It's not about trying to do it the week of, and it's definitely not about trying to do it, you know, the day of, and you can manipulate fluid and man manipulate carbohydrate intake to decrease that uh, stored amount of glycogen. And that is going to allow you to get that weight down to make where you need to be. But that's obviously more complex. If you guys are genuinely interested in how you can do that effectively is safely and easily. I'm comfortable with having that conversation personally with you, but I don't necessarily want to have uh, that information up forever on the interwebs because it can easily be misused and abused and potentially, once again, risk in literally hurting yourself because you know, your body is less resilient in that state. But then, I mean, it can even be lethal if you really do a poor job of it. So. Any questions, comments, concerns, as we're kind of getting in a little bit about, uh, yeah, the weight loss and otherwise? Yeah, go figure. If you're always starving yourself, you're also going to probably feel tired all the time and not feel good. Uh, getting back to the trying to find a body weight and a body comp that agrees with you and the lifestyle that you're willing to lead. Not that anyone can't gain a little bit of muscle or lose a little bit of fat, especially when you're talking about something that's relatively sedentary. But, you know, the effort it takes to do certain things gets to be pretty daunting. And so it's just being mindful of like what is actually feasible for someone to maintain, or to attain in the first place, and then to maintain for a long period of time and still have quality of life. So any, any other questions you guys want me to field uh, before we call it a day? Well, we're going to get going then because there's somebody at the door. So, guys, be safe. Take care of yourselves. Miss you guys. And I will talk to you more later. Bye-bye.